Hey everyone, sorry I can't be with you there today, but this is going to go over types of chemical reactions and um, this video will also help you review later when we get to our final exam, cumulative. I'm sure you're all excited about that. But uh, I wanted to get, just talk you through some of these reactions. So this section of the book was really long, and we tried our best to kind of simplify it in the notes packet. But we started off with a combination reaction. This is much more commonly called a synthesis reaction. Um, either one works for me. But just make sure that if you're going to abbreviate, don't stop at the B. Like, don't write C-O-M-B and don't write C-O, because combustion and combination both start with those same four letters. So synthesis is a totally different word, and that's probably what I will be using when I talk about these types of reactions. But we're just basically, we're taking two things and we're combining them to make one. A really good example given in the book, take magnesium plus oxygen, and you get magnesium oxide. And so the easiest way to recognize this type of reaction is you only have one product after the arrow. When you only have one product, you're synthesizing something. It doesn't matter if I'm taking two compounds and combining them to make a more complicated compound, or if I'm taking two elements like this one and combining them to make a compound. One substance after the arrow, and that is a combination reaction. Then we have our opposite here, decomposition reaction. Okay, If I ask you what a tree is doing in the woods when it's decomposing, you're going to tell me it's breaking down. Well, same thing here. A compound is going to break down into either the elements that it's made of or more two simple compounds compared comparatively. So if I have a really complicated compound before the arrow and that's all I have and it's breaking apart into multiple things after the arrow, that's a decomposition reaction. So again, easiest way to recognize it is you only have one substance before the arrow. It's the only type of reaction that you'll have one substance by itself before the arrow. Just like a combination or synthesis is the only one where you're going to have one substance by itself after the arrow. So if you need to write those notes to yourself, again, a combination reaction, only one thing after the arrow. Decomposition reaction, only one thing before the arrow, and it's breaking apart. Okay, so you're going to have to be able to recognize these reactions, so you're going to need to be able to look at that. Okay, sample problems 12 through 14. In sample problem 12, it said, what is the formula for the binary compound that decomposes to create hydrogen and bromine? Well, if it's creating hydrogen and bromine, it's got to be made out of hydrogen and bromine. And hydrogen is a plus one, bromine is a minus one. They go together, hydrogen bromide or hydrobromic acid, so HBr. That's the compound that would decompose to make hydrogen and bromine. Number 13, it gave you the first part of the arrow, the HI, and then arrow, and then it wanted you to fill in the rest. So it splits. If you, all you have before the arrow is HI, all it can do is fall apart. It's going to fall apart into hydrogen and iodine. What you have to remember is hydrogen and iodine are diatomic. Anything that ends in gen or I-N-E is diatomic when it's in its pure form. And then we have to add this two up front to balance the whole equation. All right, the number 14 said right and write and balance the equation for the formation of magnesium nitride from its elements. Well, magnesium nitride would be made out of magnesium and nitrogen, there's the two, nitrogen. So magnesium plus nitrogen. Magnesium nitride, well, magnesium's a plus two, nitrogen's a minus three. When you bring those charges down to get your ratio, you get Mg3N2. Then to balance it, we need to come back over here and put a three in front of magnesium. Okay. Uh, again, the back of the book might walk you through all of those steps, but the back of the book does have answers to sample problems. Okay, our next type of reaction was a single replacement reaction. Sometimes this will be called single displacement. It's going to be the same thing, okay? But what, what the description here is one element replaces a second element in the compound. So here, zinc is a single element by itself, and copper nitrate is a compound. On the other side of the arrow, I have copper, single element by itself, and then zinc nitrate compound. So zinc stole copper's partner, kicked it to the curb, and became zinc nitrate. Okay, you can think of this if you want an analogy, a single replacement, you have a single guy dancing, and he cuts in on a couple and steals the girl. So zinc steals the girl away from copper. So sample problem 15 was working with some single replacements. It gave you the first half of the arrow, and you had to fill in the second half. Okay, so iron plus lead nitrate. Well, lead is going to get kicked to the curb. Iron steals the girl. We get iron nitrate. 
It didn't tell us what iron's charge was going to be, so to make your life easy, you just keep it the same charge as lead and give it two nitrates, and then it's already balanced. On the second one, a little bit trickier, we have chlorine and sodium iodide. That was what was given before the arrow, and you had to come up with the after the arrow part. Well, chlorine is going to steal sodium because metals and nonmetals bond with each other, and so chlorine is going to kick iodine to the curb because those two are very similar. So iodine gets kicked out. We get sodium chloride, plus one, minus one, they balance. And then we have to go and add these twos to balance the overall reaction. We're going to get a lot of practice with this next week. All right, part C gave you calcium and water. That one's a lot harder to see. One of the ways that we can look at this a little bit differently, instead of water, H2O, we could write HOH. So you have a hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion. Okay, calcium's a metal, it's positive, hydrogen ion's positive, so hydrogen gets kicked out by itself, and hydroxide is the girl that calcium steals away from hydrogen. If you ended up writing hydrogen and calcium oxide, you're on the right track as far as what's happening. It's just a little bit trickier in this particular example. And then finally, we have zinc and sulfuric acid. Again, hydrogen is going to act like a metal, for these reactions because it's a positively charged ion and zinc is going to become a positively charged ion so it's going to steal away the sulfate, the negative part of this compound. So we get zinc sulfate and then hydrogen gas. Again, we'll work a lot more with this next week and you're going to learn some predicting product stuff this week as well. Okay, coming up over here, we have the activity series. The description was a list of elements in order of decreasing reactivity. Now, class notes here, Maybe we could get a little pause in the video so you can copy this down. But the activity series is used for determining if a single replacement reaction will occur or not. So go ahead and pause the video, get that written down, and then we'll go ahead and we'll move on um, with this, these notes. So in the book, the activity series looks like this. Okay, so if we're looking at this, uh, lithium is the most reactive element on this particular list of elements, okay? It's the most reactive element here, so it's at the top, okay? Decreasing reactivity down all the way to silver. So what this is saying is if I have a, a lithium and sodium, or sorry, potassium chloride, we'll just go with these first two. Lithium is more reactive than potassium, so lithium will steal potassium's partner. But if I have potassium and I have lithium chloride, Okay, lithium is more reactive than potassium, so potassium cannot steal lithium's partner. Okay, so all of these reactions over here that we talked about as examples before, if we look at zinc versus copper, zinc is higher on the activity series than copper. So zinc can steal copper's partner and this reaction will happen. But the reverse reaction would never happen. Copper cannot steal zinc's partner to make zinc, pure zinc and copper nitrate. It can't do it. It's not reactive enough. And the way that we can tell that, again, is by looking at our activity series. Okay, Zinc is here, and then copper is down here. So zinc is more reactive and will steal copper's partner. Okay, That, again, is the activity series. It is only used on single replacement reactions. Only for single replacement reactions. So if you need to write that, please write it, because people try to use this for other types of reactions all the time, but it is only for single replacement reactions. All right, our final, or our next, sorry, our fourth type of reaction is double replacement. So this one, we exchange positive ions between two compounds or exchange negative ions between two compounds, same thing. But we're, we have two couples now, two couples dancing, and they're going to trade partners. That's kind of the analogy for this. Okay, the reaction will produce a precipitate, a gas, or a molecular compound such as water. And the book actually gave all three of these examples. Okay, so we have sodium sulfide and cadmium nitrate, and they switch partners. So we get cadmium sulfide and sodium nitrate. A precipitate is when you get a solid when you mix two aqueous solutions. So that was the example with a precipitate, okay? The next example, sodium cyanide and sulfuric acid. Well, the hydrogen and the sodium trade partners. So we end up with hydrogen cyanide or hydrocyanic acid and sodium sulfate, okay? But the HCN is a gas, okay? So that comes out as a gas and the sodium sulfate stays behind as aqueous. And then our final example from the book is calcium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. 
Well, the hydrogen and the hydroxide get together and they make water. And then calcium and chloride get together and make the other compound. So again, you have two compounds and they're trading partners. The most difficult thing with these reactions is you have to balance the charges in the products. Otherwise, you might create a reaction that is impossible to balance overall. So always balance your charges with those ionic compounds. Okay, so we get to sample problems 16 and 17. Uh, number 16 gives you the reactants, and then it tells you one of the products. You have to figure out the other one. So again, if you want to look in the back of the book, all these answers are there. If you want to come back and look at this video later, you can look at, look at this video later. Um, 17 also gives you the, the reactants, and then it gives you the product one of the products and you have to figure out the other product. So if, for example, on 17, we'll say 17A, it tells you that water is formed. So it gives you KOH, H3PO4, and it tells you water is one of the products. So that should automatically be what you write. And water is made out of hydrogen and hydroxide. So those two pieces are taken. Now we have potassium and we have phosphate left. We have to put those together to get the other compound, potassium phosphate. Just be careful because the charges need to balance. That's where this 3 comes from. PO4 has a negative 3 charge. Potassium is a positive 1. So that 3 comes down with a potassium to balance those charges. So again, that's the trickiest part is trying to figure out how to balance those charges so you create a balanceable reaction. Okay, final type of reaction, and everybody's favorite is a combustion reaction. We're going to do a demo day a little bit before spring break and we're gonna we're gonna do a lot of combustions because those are definitely the most exciting but we're gonna take a compound or an element and react it with oxygen to produce energy in the form of heat and light so this can happen with something like a metal okay magnesium and oxygen creates a really really bright light that's a that's one of the demos that we'll be doing but if you look at this reaction there's only one thing after the arrow and hopefully that's sparking something in your memory right now. If it only has one thing after the arrow, it is a synthesis reaction or a combination reaction. Okay? So this is a synthesis reaction. Now, because it's using oxygen and it happens to give off heat and light, it is also a combustion reaction. Okay? But not all of them are. If you take iron and you put it in with oxygen, you're going to get an iron oxide. That's called rusting. That's not giving off a lot of heat and light, so it's definitely not a combustion, but it is a combination. So if you're not sure that it's giving off heat and light, you should never label one of these a combustion. The combustions that we are going to work with are combustions of hydrocarbons, okay? And they're always going to have some kind of carbon compound with hydrogen. It might have other elements as well, okay? But we're combining that with oxygen, and we're always going to get CO2 and water, and only if it has other elements will we get a third product. Okay, so down here, combustion of a hydrocarbon, this is our class notes for, for combustions. The, again, this is what I want you to look for for combustions. You're always going to have some kind of hydrocarbon fuel made out of hydrogen and carbon. That's where hydrocarbon comes from. Plus oxygen, and it always gives you CO2 and water. Okay, you guys are living, walking combustion reactions. You consume hydrocarbons, sugars, proteins, fats. You're eating hydrocarbons. You breathe in oxygen, and your cells combine these two things, and we breathe out carbon dioxide and water. So you guys are a living, walking combustion reaction. Okay, and that is the type that we're going to work with most often. So sample problems 18 and 19, we're working with those combustions of hydrocarbons. Sample problem 18, it just gave you the fuel, you just had to combine it with oxygen. On the other side of the arrow, automatically write CO2 and water, and then you had to balance them. Okay? Number 19, same thing. It gave you the fuels, but these ones are a little bit more complicated with some oxygens added in there. But every time you're writing combustion, you're combining it with oxygen, you're creating CO2 and water, and then you just have to balance it. So three of the four substances in a combustion reaction are always going to be the same. Oxygen before the arrow, carbon dioxide, and water after the arrow. One other thing to note up here, if you look at this, I put a G right here for, for gas, okay? When you burn something, it is a high temperature reaction, and the water doesn't come out as a liquid. You don't light a match and see water dripping from the end of the match, okay? The water is going to come out as a gas, and so this is not a typo. When you see H2O gas at the end of a combustion reaction, that is the physical state of the water in that reaction. 
Okay, lesson check questions for chapter 11.2, um, number 20. What are the five types of reactions? So again, just listing them. Decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, oh, synthesis, combustion, okay? 21 wanted you to classify each reaction and then balance it. So A was a combustion. We get 2, 9, 6, 6. B is a decomposition. You get 2, 1, 3. Okay, that one's one of the trickier decompositions. Okay, again, we don't have two elements after the arrow, but what we have is we have one compound and it's breaking apart into two simpler compounds. Each of these is only made out of two elements. This one was made out of three, so that's a decomposition. Okay, number or 21C is a synthesis. Okay, four, one, two, when you're all balanced. And 21D is a single replacement. And we get one, two, two, one when you balance it. Number 22 is describing the reactants for a reaction. And then it asks you what kind of reaction is it. So A says an aqueous solution of two ionic compounds. The only reaction type that we've learned that has two compounds before the arrow is a double replacement. Okay, Especially if they're two aqueous compounds, we're taking them we're combining them, we're going to get a precipitate, a gas, or water. So A is a double replacement. Part B, a single compound. If all you have before the arrow is a single compound, all it can do is decompose. So 22B is decomposition, and you're going to get two simpler products. Part C says you have two elements. If all you have is two elements before the arrow, all they can do is combine to make a compound, that's synthesis. And then D, oxygen, and a carbon-hydrogen compound. That's classic combustion, and we're going to make CO2 and water after the arrow. Number 23, I wanted you to complete and balance the reactions. Okay, Again, if you want to come back and look at these, we are going to practice a lot with this. But part A, they gave you the reactants, Okay, and it's two compounds. When you have two compounds, they're going to trade partners. So mercury is now with iodine, calcium with nitrate double replacement. Part B, they give you two elements. They're going to combine. Now their charges make them combine in a 1 to 3 ratio, so AlCl3, and then balancing it with those coefficients. Part C, silver plus HCl. Now if this one, if you put hydrogen plus silver chloride, you at least recognize the type of reaction, so I'm proud of you, okay? But this is a single replacement, and silver, if you remember, looking at the activity series, is at the very bottom of the list, which means it is not reactive. And it will not be able to steal hydrogen's partner away from it. So I put NR for no reaction. And then part D, it gave you a, carbon, a hydrocarbon compound and oxygen. Whenever you have a carbon compound plus oxygen, you're going to make CO2 and water, and all you have to do is balance it after that. Okay. And then finally, number 24, it says, after wood burns, the ash weighs much less than the original wood. Explain why the law of conservation of mass is not violated in this situation. Okay. Well, the products escape as gases. So the only mass that was lost floated away. It wasn't destroyed, so it's still obeying the law of conservation of mass. It just floated away, so we don't have that when we weigh our final products. Okay. All right, the final thing was the history of dynamite. History of dynamite had a pretty amazing chemical equation right here, okay? That's dynamite over on the left, and then we have four different products on the right, okay? What kind of reaction is it? Well, it's dynamite, but it is not a combustion, okay? We don't, we don't have, we're not combining oxygen with that substance. It is that substance by itself creating a whole bunch of other substances, and that is a decomposition, okay? Decomposition. Now, the reason why it's so explosive is, uh, look at all those substances. Three of the four of them are gases all the time, okay? And water is a gas if you have enough energy. So you're creating a lot of gases from something that was solid, and that, ex that rapid expansion of, of material is what causes the explosiveness for dynamite. All right, fireworks are another kind of explosive. How are they different? How is dynamite different from fireworks? Well, fireworks do have fire, and that is a combustion. You have to have oxygen to make a firework work. You do not have to have that for dynamite. All right, that's the end of our homework review. Hope you enjoy the rest of the class. Again, sorry I couldn't be there with you today.